Howdy, Meeps, and welcome to the Meeple Syrup Show. Welcome, welcome, one and all. It is Wednesday night at 9 o'clock. That means it is what? Meeple Syrup Time. That's right, it's Meeple Syrup Time. Yay! (laughs) And we're here this week uh, for Designer Spotlight with our special guest, Lizzie Funkhauser. How are you doing, Liz? Hi, good. And where's Seb? He and Derek are at a park, I believe. I got them out of the house. Oh, very smart, very smart. That is very smart. Yeah, it's very smart. I, I we appreciate that. Although we all, is, of course, love Derek and Seb. So, I mean, okay, but he is a very noisy little toddler. So, yeah, that's kind of how it goes, right? So, how is it out on the West Coast? Hot still. Uh, yeah. I'm saying those fall vibes that everyone's posting about. So, I'm trying to make a lot of soup, but it's just miserable because hot soup and hot weather don't really combine. Yeah. Mm. This, so, this is going to be your first winter out there, right? No, we actually lived in California oh, for three years. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. And so you're so I guess you're used to the, the non changing of seasons? Oh, uh, I mean I guess. Yeah, we were in the Mojave Desert, so it's actually not as bad here. I mean there's Oh yeah, because I guess the desert is pretty bad. Yeah, I mean out there it would get like one twenty in the summer. That oh my gosh. Not unusual. No. So and, it's not quite uh, that hot here, which is nice. Jesse, did you but, drive through the Mojave on your way back home? Mm. Um, you don't really because that's like the military post was on Derek was in the army. Yeah, that's so what I thought. You kind of drive by it, but you don't really go up into the, the uh, let me up into the we, main desert. That's all we, training ground. Yeah, we drove through the northern part of um, Nevada, Nevada, so yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's. I think that's a technically a different class of desert um, than the southern part because there's like four different types of desert. Anyway. Why, why don't you why don't you Wikipedia that for us while we're talking? I was just looking at it on Google Maps right now, but like we we stopped at a lot of like the like rest stops, and a lot of them have these like yes. signs that are yes. like you're in this kind of desert. This is and a so, class three desert. I don't know. Right. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Anyway, well, I mean, we should make a game about that. Totally make a game about that. Cool. So, uh, Lizzie, tell us what's up. Board game spotlight, game design. What's on your mind right now? Oh, Kickstarter is insane the last like month month and a half and so we haven't had time to do anything except learn games and um do like the preview live streams that we do right so we've been averaging four a week for the last what uh, yeah that's insane How? we just don't want to say no to anyone but we are still saying no to people and we have a packed schedule and it's been a lot of a lot of cram time yeah that sounds really intense um I mean, I have a hard enough time learning one game in a week, uh, and yet you're learning four. How do you, is, is there a secret to learning games quickly and playing them? And... I hope they have a video. That's always a good thing when they have a how to learn video. That helps. Um, Derek usually reads the rule book. I'll look over it. Um, we have very different learning styles, so the thing he picks up on is not what I pick up on vice versa. So we kind of mellow each other like, oh, this is what you're supposed to do. Oh, I remember seeing that, but I didn't understand. And here's what you need to do on this side. And so we kind of balance each other in that. And then the more games you play, the easier it is to pick up on more games because you sure mechanics. And then if you play similar designers, they have that same style or the same icons. And you just kind of learn, you know, if there's an arrow, it's like, oh, that's a reroll, obviously. Or you just kind of pick up more things the more games you play. You get the shorthand stuff, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And how are you finding like the volume? Is it is it too much? Do you think do you think there are too many games being made, Lizzie? I don't know about too many games are made. We're trying to cover too many games, maybe. Um, but you expand. The the um types of game that are being made are becoming broader, like the the subject matter, and I think that's really good because we're seeing games about things that we never would have. We just covered like dance card and that's a really cute family mid- midweight game that's about like it's school dance and i mean i don't think we would have seen something like that a couple of years ago and i think the community is growing and more non gamers gamers are coming in that are looking yeah. for these new different things like what wingspan did where it was like this bird thing that a lot of gamers were like not very interested in they wanted dragons instead of birds but a lot of non-gamers were like that game's really pretty that's something different i would like to play that so i think that's helping with the diversity of the types of games we're seeing what's the what's the i mean you've you've obviously been uh exposed to a ton of forthcoming games in the last couple of months what do you think the most surprising or innovative thing that you've seen is 
Surprising or interview. Um, I really like Flotilla. We're going to be streaming that one soon. And it has I like Flotilla. Mechanic where you are either on, like, the water. And then at any point in the game, you can flip everything. And it completely changes your deck. The deck is, like, double-sided. It's like a Oh, neat. And so instead of being these water people, you're now, like, in the air. And so everything that you're doing is now different. Instead of creating or collecting the goods, you're now, like, selling them. And so... It's really neat because no one has to flip sides and everyone can flip sides and it doesn't matter what point in the game you do it. It might be more beneficial to you at a certain point because of what you've collected, but it's just, it's kind of like two games in one. Right. Yeah. And, and, and pretty when, heavy. when you flip, you mm-hmm. can't flip back. You just say, right. I, I'm, I'm making, I'm pivoting now. Mm-hmm. That's actually yeah. really awesome. And, and when you go, also dominoes to how things go. So the new thing is every game is very different based on basically how much people are driving one way or another. Yeah. I enjoyed cool. that one too. Yeah. Very, very cool. Um, Lizzie, let's talk about design because that's kind of why you're here. We'll talk about Board Game Spotlight, of course. But design in terms of uh, The Walking Dead, Something to Fear. How was it jumping into design? Your first published design is you know, one of the biggest IPs out there in nerddom. Mm -hmm. How was that? And what Um, was it like working with Derek? I can't imagine. Oh, you know, he just kind of wouldn't let me leave it alone. Like, he just kept coming after me like, oh, what are you going to do? It actually did not start out as a Walking Dead game. It was a different IP for Skybound. Um, And they really liked the game, but they didn't want to go in that direction with that IP. Right. So uh, they said, here, try it as a Walking Dead game. So we changed a few things, and it still worked really well. And so we were really excited to coach them. But um, there was kind of a lot of pressure because it's such a big IP and you knew a lot of people were going to be able to see it and be excited about the characters. Um, but at the same guy- time, I was just more focused on the gameplay and not, I let Derek worry about the the Walking Dead part of it and like the characters and making sure that all fit. And I worked more on like the mechanics and making sure it was more balanced and all the, the little intricacies. Sounds like a good division of labor. Yes. Derek Did- is much more like artistic and I'm much more like logical. And did you did you read The Walking Dead or did Derek only read The Walking Dead? Uh, Derek read it and he watched the show and I kind of like was on the fringes. So I know a lot of it, but I'm mm-hmm. not super into all that gore. So, <laughs> right, I, watched, I get it. I've seen some of it and I, I've kept up with the show and like what's happening. Like I know what happens with the characters. but Right, right, right. Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I have a personal question because I, I was a big fan of the comic, but less of the show. They deviated hard from each other. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm wondering which one is the, the game more attuned to the comic the or the com- game or the, definitely the comic? Tried to keep it more with the comics, especially with the art. We definitely went with a more comic right. art style. And so mm-hmm. we, mm-hmm. Derek loved the comics. He read them all. At, like he was up to that date. And obviously now at Skybound, he's able to get copies of them to read. Right, right, so right. So we definitely try to stick more to the original source material. Cool. Okay. Very cool. Um, just before we get on with questions, I just wanted to say hi to Zach Connolly. Hi to some Derek Funkhauser guy. I don't know what some he's guy. doing. Here. Hi to Shem Phillips. Uh, hi to Mike Pichal. Hi to Jason Miller. Uh, everybody that's here watching. Uh, if you have questions for Lizzie or the rest of the crew, please do we, put it in there. We do actually have two. some questions. Go ahead, Jesse. Yeah. So Zach wants to know what you think the hot mechanism of 2020 will be. Ooh. Put on your predictor hat. Well, 2019 was definitely the year of the roll and right. So I think at least at the beginning of the year, that momentum will still carry. And then it might switch into something like, I don't know. I think maybe work replacements may be coming back in mm. like, more varied ways like kind of what we're seeing with with roll and rights how it's like a roll and right and something you know right yeah yeah, yeah. maybe people are going to go back to the worker placement and try and do a worker placement with something okay cool yeah yeah i get that like uh not a not a revolution but an evolution yeah like euro-esque cool. Yes. Yeah. Euro adjacent. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because I've heard lately on industry talks that um, the $50 game is no longer a thing and uh, that it's really hard to sell $50 games and that $40 games might be the new thing. What are your thoughts on that, Lizzie? I mean, I've definitely seen it on Kickstarter with uh, game prices wanting to be at that like 
39 to like 41 sweet spot and it is a lot harder and I um I've seen a lot of games with like maybe that had minis originally go down to standees to kind of cut that cost and make a cheaper game for people and so they might offer the deluxe version that does have the more expensive things but I've seen a lot more people trying to get down to that $40 ish limit Hmm. I think maybe it's just because there's so much on Kickstarter. If you look and you're like, wow, a fifty plus dollar game, you know, that might be too much. And then you see that thirty nine and you're like, Oh, I can do thirty nine. That's not the psychology crazy. around pricing yeah. is is ridiculous. It's, it's really actually pretty fun to study. Grocery yeah. stores are fantastic at it. But that's yeah. a good point because you were just saying, as you said, like mass is starting to come more and more into the space and they're going to be really afraid of price points like that, right? Because if you're not sure what game you're picking up and you're like, you're not going to spend 70 bucks on that first one. Right, right, that's right. 60, well, that's 70 for us because yeah. it's 50 for you. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, that's kind of the problem. But if they see something that's maybe a bit more within a conventional price range what they're used to right because remember when they're going into a store they're picking monopoly for like 19.99 or something <laughs> right like, that's not what a game is right and so it's i think we need to we're gonna have a lot of middle ground that i think will be interesting space to play in yeah i, I hope so I, I know just thinking about the one of the last kickstarters that we ran which was uh complexity that we were at this weird dollar value like 69 or something like that where it was mm. like people are saying well it looks like a good game but i can't justify paying x number of dollars when for just yeah. 20 dollars more i get this world full of miniatures and for 20 dollars less i get a game that's the same game as that or you know, yeah. similar weight so yeah it's and i think i think it's just kind of rocking and, and kind of i don't know finding not the right audience but yeah. figuring it's it out good. especially on kickstarter too right mm -hmm. um and not and not to bring up the other Funkhauser, but he he did make a point in the chat yeah, that's relevant. Point. Yeah, he said that there's he believes there's a no man's land between forty nine dollars and sixty nine dollars. Exactly what we talked right? about, and I've yeah. talked about before with complexity that that is where it kind of sat, right? Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, like I know anything about psychology. Um. Let's see here. Oh, hi to Brad Bachelor, and hi to Reed Brad. Maybe we'll have you back on sometime where. You know, if you, if you do what Lizzie did and use your phone. Oh, it's Brad. We had a problem with Brad last oh, yeah. week, too, right? We're having some yeah. problems with BeLive, so. I got to think it's BeLive because these weren't happening before. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, Jason Miller had a question here. It's, oh, no. I, I guess, tongue-in-cheek. He said, why don't you let Derek win more often? He's more sensitive than you. Yes. We love Jason. We've met him several times at uh, conventions. He likes to make fun of us. Derek does win a lot. He just doesn't always win on screen. And I won the first like dozen games because Derek was so busy setting everything up and monitoring comments and stuff that right. set this precedent that Lizzie always wins. And it's not true, guys. I promise. Derek has a very good track record. He beat like, he's just really busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, hi to Angelica. Uh, it's nice to see you on. Um, Lizzie, so tell us, what is it like de designing with your significant other? Um, it's a lot of trying to manage his expectations. He goes off and he's like, oh, this would be so cool. And I kind of have to be the bearer of bad news and say that's never going to work. Let's kind of bring it back down a little. Mm -hmm. um, but in the opposite, when I have an idea, he's the one who's like pushing me forward and really helps develop it out of me and be like, okay, well, what else do you want to add to this? What's your idea? And he can take what's in my mind and put it down on paper. So we really do balance each other really well when it comes to designing. It's really a nice balance between us. That's awesome. Um, yeah. it's funny. <laughs> this is what Shem said. Lizzie is smart. Derek is pretty. We actually took a, a BuzzFeed quiz about who you are in the Big Bang Theory, and I got Leonard and Derek got Penny. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Shem is not too no, far off. Not, I love it. That, that was a good off. assessment because it did say paraphrasing. He was pretty on. He was fun. <laughs> And that was a while ago, too. That wasn't just right now. Um, Angela Angelica said that you're getting pretty into hanging out with Canadians and playing Canadian games, Lizzie. What do you think of that? Do you like Canadians? I mean, my 
dad's side of the family, they came down from Canada. They're French Canadian, so I do have Canadian blood. I love hockey. I love maple syrup. I mean, y'all are great people. What's not to love? <laughs> What's not to love? There you go. I mean, we've, got, we've got hockey and maple syrup, people. We're done. Yeah. I actually didn't know that. I, I usually know that about people when their families come down from Canada. Because for some reason, they always like to tell me that. But I don't think you've ever told me that. That's really cool. It's so, several generations. Of sure. And were they from like uh, like the French side, like uh, mm -hmm. Quebec side? Cool. Yeah. Very neat. And what's your what's your dad's or family's last name then? Oh, uh, his family's last name is Manso. Okay, cool. Neat, neat, neat. So, uh, another question. We have a new question. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this one's saying, uh, what game would, uh, you like to see an expansion for? And then the follow-up is, is there any chance of, uh, getting a walking dead, something to fear expansion in the future? There is, we have been working on one. We have some ideas. I'm not gonna say any more than that because I don't know how much I'm allowed to say. Um, yes. game that I would like to see an expansion for. Mm-hmm. All my favorite games have expansions already. <laughs> I could see like an Architects expansion, but I mean, he just came out with Paladin. So, I mean. Oh, well, like there you go, Sham. Architects. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm trying to think what other games is behind me. Ex Libris could use an expansion. Oh, okay. We'll, we'll talk to Adam about doing that. Yeah, maybe like a classics expansion or something. Ooh, like that. that'd be kind of cool. That'd be actually really cool. Yeah. Um, so what are what's up for you design wise next, other than the expansion? <laughs> Most of it is stuff that we're working on for Skybound, obviously that we just okay. didn't talk about because you know Skybound. Right, <laughs> right, right. Non disclosures and all. I mean, there's some. Um, I was working on like a deck building game. Derek and I are working on a roll and write game. Mm -hmm, I've seen that I've one. I've been yeah. developing with Derek. I'm not designing, but I'm helping develop his Fate of the West game. So that was what propelled us into this world like four years ago. Oh, yeah. I remember California. seeing that. Just like yeah. this this expansive thing that covered a tabletop. Is yeah. it still as expansive? Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to it. Um, but yeah. it started out with like a worker placement and then it was like dice worker placement and so it's had a lot of work to it and um his co-designer chris he met him online through one of like the groups mm -hmm. um, we actually met him last year at gen con for the first time they pitched it to a couple people it wasn't quite where it needed to be so um we've been working on it a lot um we were working on it we went to the druid city retreat in february and they did a ton of work on that so derek and i've been working trying to get that honed and hopefully it's going to get released next year very nice very, very cool. What's the hardest thing for you design-wise? What do you think? What's one area that you think, like, ah, I have a weakness in that area? The hardest thing is honestly finding time to do it. Like when I'm working for Spotlight stuff, it's all scheduling and that kind of stuff. I can do that on my phone when I'm downstairs with baby. Mm -hmm. um, but design is something you really need to like sit down and have complete focus and no interruptions. Mm -hmm. So the only time you can do that is when, you know, baby's sleeping after you know, Derek's home and we're done with whatever live stream. We we're not working on something that we're trying to review or something. So it's mostly for me just finding the time to dedicate to it. And like, cause I, and if you're going to do it, I need to do it for like an hour or a couple hours at least. A solid block of time. Yeah. It's not mm. like I can do it 15 minutes here or 15 minutes there. So no. just finding that big chunk of time that's not dedicated to something else. So that's why right now I'm really not doing a lot of design work because it's just so busy this month, especially with Kickstarter and sub is, you know, he's a little needy sometimes. <laughs> How old is he now? Uh, two. He turned two in July. Wow. He's getting so big. So he's he's going to be taller than you and I combined very soon. You know that, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. He is definitely more than half my height. He's getting to the point where I can't always keep up with him. Like, I was trying to wipe his nose today, and he was running around the couch, and he, like, almost slapped me before I got a hold of him. Well, it's hard to run with, like, bent over. <laughs> I know you're not bending that far, but it's still hard. It's still super hard. I was just trying hard. to catch him. I was just like full on sprinting around the couch. After <laughs> so that's going to be fun in a couple of years when he's much bigger than me. Yeah, maybe he'll listen to you by then. With all of this stuff that you're balancing, do you find you have to like be really scheduled on like everything you're doing? Because it sounds like there's so many things going on at once. Yes. 
my phone, I like put everything in there. So when we start a giveaway in the group, I put it in there. When it ends, I put it in there because otherwise I'll forget. When we have an interview, when I have a, a game that we're learning, it all goes in my phone so I can see it. I try to like import it into like an online one for Derek to see, but he doesn't always check it anyway. So I mean, I keep it up to date every like two weeks. Um, so I'm pretty organized on my own, but I've definitely learned to be more organized recently because of how much I'm handling. Um, and then going through, I always like flag whenever I get emails, making sure that I go back and check up on them and follow through. So it's, it's been a learning process since I took over the spotlight. Mm -hmm. for sure. Thankfully I haven't dropped anything. I've been a couple minutes late to like interviews and stuff. Um, but we haven't like missed any live streams. There was the overlap of Derek running it and me running it and him like still feeling like he needs to schedule stuff. And then me being like, but I've already scheduled something. Um, so we, that's where a lot of like the double live streams have come in as well, where I'm like, okay, well, we'll do them the next day. Uh, but overall, I think it's been pretty smooth considering I don't really have a background in any of this. Well, yeah, so I think this it's actually, going great. As, yeah, I think you guys are phenomenal. You're on all the time. It's crazy. I'm like, do you sleep? But kind of connected to this as well, because I think it sounds like you've been through a lot of different things to see what works we'd like to ask designers if there's any kind of like uh tools or apps or things that they found were just really good tools that they would it, everyone should know about this and do you find there's anything that you've been using that you're just kind of like i wish designers knew this thing existed no you're like nope, I'm, just regular I'm, google I'm, calendar <laughs> person so all of my stuff is turn and paper um so, like, with The Walking Dead, we had the comics to go to, so we didn't really need to do a ton of research, like, online. Um, I am toying with, like, a World War II game, so I've been looking up, like, um, a lot of Wikipedia and, like, that kind of stuff, trying to find more in-depth articles about that. But, again, I have mm. not delved as deeply into that as I, was, as I would like to. Um, I try to, like, keep it simple. Derek's all, like, trying to make these crazy prototypes. And I'm like, you're going to change that in, like, two days. Let's just use paper right now and cubes. And he's like, no, I'm going to print out full art. And I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> he likes it. He enjoys that. I remember yeah, him he sending me he, like, something. Cuts it out and prints it. And we play it, like, twice. And he's like, oh, this isn't working. And then he, like, scraps all of that. And, you know, we have paper to write on for the next year. But he's, like, redoing the game completely. And I'm yeah, like, oh, I mean, just... Seb will have a lot of paper to color on. That's all it is. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, so I want to... Stop coloring on my walls. Hey, right? You tape the paper up to the walls instead mm. of throwing it out. Life hack. Yeah. Um, he's smarter than that. He'll rip it off. Well, it'll at least keep him occupied for oh. a second. Give you a chance to intercept him before the pen hits the wall. Right. Um, on the topic of pens, though... Uh, you, you mentioned that you're, you design with pen and paper. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's really interesting, I think, because most of us, uh, use software of various kinds, not necessarily going, you know, full Derek and trying to make a polished looking first prototype, but still, you know, we use GIMP and, and Photoshop or InDesign or like other digital tools. Um, what do you find the, uh, biggest challenges are with pen and paper based uh with taking pen and paper as your first uh, approach and primary approach to making games it's hard to make changes because once you put it down and then you're like trying to scribble off so then you have to repeat the whole thing on another sheet so it can be very time consuming and i have like horrible handwriting so like trying to get it to where other people would be able to read it and play it mm -hmm. it takes a lot of time to like write it out and get it all right. presentable but if it's just Eric and I, it's just like, okay, here's an X. That's what that means. Like, go for it. That's right. It means I win. And yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you do you find that uh, that by working in pen and paper, it um, gives you a design advantage over the the sort of digital first approach? Do you I think, think it makes yeah. me less attached to it because that's something I struggle with. Is if I originally have an idea and then it doesn't work, I get very attached to it and I don't want to get rid of it. But if it's just pen and paper, it's easier to just, like, push it aside and be like, okay, I didn't spend that much time in it. I'm not that attached to it that I can't move on and do something else. Right. So your your investment is low. Yeah. It's fair. interesting. And it's a little tear and you're going to the next one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so right. There's always that. Yeah. Legacy yeah. style. <laughs> <laughs> so Zach Connolly is saying, I do pen and paper with post-it notes inserted in sleeves. And definitely, I know Jesse and I will 
use uh, post-it notes to like revise and just yeah. usually Jesse's method is if it's got red pen on it, it means we just change it. So he'll write on red with red pen on it as we're playing. So lots, lots of ways to do it. I think. Post-it yeah. notes are great because yeah. that's something you can just like put over it and be like, oh, I'm going to do this. That works. And just cover something up so you don't have to scrap everything. I love post-it notes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and whiteboards, that's something else Sen and I will use. Uh, the initial brainstorming phase of the design is usually either whiteboards or um, we have digital paper, but still the idea being like, you can quickly sketch a board or a card and, um, and yeah, also I erase it. <laughs> I no? use whiteboards, I'm left-handed. So it's uh, very difficult to find something like that. Without you're wiping papers. as you're like, writing. Yeah, you're wiping as you're going. Yeah. So you have to like, which in, it's very awkward to write like that. Yeah. So. When, I, when I see you next, remind me. The, of that little problem you have yeah yeah yeah. i have uh i have um special markers for that mm. Mm. but i can't you know what the funny thing is i can't find ones like this i can't find so i'm a teacher so i have whiteboard markers all over the place but i can't find big thick ones but i have really thin ones that stadler makes that are that require a lot of friction to take off they're still dry erase uh but they don't rub off uh when i write over when i drag my hand over it i'm not left-handed but i'm just messy so is this? No, it's not like that. It, it's I mean, it's thinner, but it's like um, but it's specially formulated to not wipe off. Oh, okay, you have, to, you have to like rub it off. It's a much much harder to rub off. Anyways, I will get you some of those because I have a that bunch. It's amazing. Yeah, solve a lot of my problems. Yeah, maybe right, especially yeah. if you like roll and writes. Um, so in in the, in the process of design, where does broccoli come in? No, I'm just kidding. I know. <laughs> Yes, yes to broccoli. Yes, broccoli. Uh, there no. was a game, yes, broccoli. Oh, that's right. There is a game called yeah. Yes, broccoli. Yeah, Daniel and Derek and everyone like jumped on board and helped fund it because they liked it. They're like, this is cute. This should fund. Yeah, right. Um, how does it how does it feel uh, being like a taste maker and a designer at the same time? Um, you definitely get to see so many more games this way and so it tells you like what's been made so i mean we've definitely had ideas we're like oh this is so cool and then we find a game that fits that niche or like works better than what we had planned so you're like okay i don't have to devote this time to that anymore because right. obviously someone else has done it um and we can also see what's popular and what's you know is a good direction to go to like derek did have an idea for like a roll and write coloring book and we were like starting to work on it and then um john had his signed at yep. I think it was, like any boards and cards and derek's like oh someone already did that so i guess we don't need to do that right 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 sorry i'm just writing questions up here oh. that's okay i'm posting a whole bunch of the group chat right now <laughs> Jay, so, Jason uh, is I, Jason's calling me out for calling you a taste maker. I think he thinks I'm going to make your head explode or something. Derek did have a game idea for like a trader, and everyone like eats a piece of candy at the beginning of the game, and one of them like it dyes their mouth a certain color, and that's how you know they're the trader type thing. So they can't <laughs> quickly had to tell Derek that that was not a viable option for like different reasons. It sounds cool, but it's not something you can play back to back. You know, allergies. You know, all yeah. too many variables. And he's like, "Yeah, oh, it'd be so cool." I'm like, "It would." But you can just play that game at home with like Jolly Ranchers or something. Like right, that. right, right, right. <laughs> uh, so here's a good question because we're talking about design and kind of as you said, you have to keep changing gears so quickly. So what do you do to kind of get into the right design mindset? How do you suddenly go from okay, I'm turning off spotlight? to focus on this or I'm turning off, you know, family stuff to focus on this. Cause I think that's a big problem for a lot of people. It is. Um, I like to know beforehand that it's going to like happen, like kind of schedule out. So that way, like I know to try and make sure that I have stuff done so that when I sit down, I'm not worried like, Oh my gosh, there's a sink full of dishes I need to worry about. Or, Oh, we have this game that we need to work on instead. So dedicating being like, okay, this tonight, we're going to do this and I can, focus on that during the day and get into the right mindset. So just knowing that it's coming up helps a lot. And then just sitting there, Derek helps me focus a lot and we can just bounce off each other. And a lot of times I like to just scroll on my phone or something, like something kind of like mindless activity that lets my mind wander and I'm more productive when mm -hmm. I'm not trying to focus on something. Like that's when mm -hmm. I get a lot more of my ideas is when I'm mindlessly doing something else. And then I'm like, oh, this, this works perfectly. That's why I like washing the dishes. 
<laughs> yeah, I, yeah. Everyone I, has their zone out, right? You do that all day. I, I love washing my washes dish, washing dishes. Um, Brad Bachelor asks, are there any games that have inspired you as a designer, Lizzie? He's even got his hand on his chin like he's asking you that. I love Welcome To, and I love how they've been able to do all those different expansions for it mm -hmm. and how each one is still like the core game, but it just adds something like the winter one where you want to get the numbers in order because you get bonuses with that really speaks to me because that's what I would try to do anyway. And so being able to do that is part of the game. <laughs> now really I can score points for, for doing that. I know. like It's, it's, it's much more driving force. To, and then uh, like the Halloween one was also really cool because I always want to get the pools, but it's very difficult to get all the pools and I've been able it to really do that. And I had it in a way with the, the candy corn and the dose where if you can collect those and you can turn those in for the pool to get some more points. So I love how they've taken the things I love about the game and added that to the expansion to mm -hmm. make it I don't know, a little bit more depth, a little bit more challenging, just a little different. So Yeah, and you can you can put it in, take mm -hmm. it out however you need it. Uh, other questions. Zach Connolly asks uh, because you get to play so many games through Spotlight, have you found that these games have changed your development or designs? Um, occasionally we'll run across like a little mechanic or something that we really like and we'll try and take inspiration from it. We don't want to, like, obviously, you don't want to copy someone else's mm -hmm. work, so we try and use the games that we play as just like, a, okay, what really works, what do we like and work from there? Um, I don't have any like specific examples because there's just so many, so games, many games. Yeah. Right. But occasionally there's something that like, you're like, oh, I really like this. I'm going to write that down and remember that for later. It sparks so, yeah, interest, it, it right? Sparks yeah, it sparks an idea or maybe it's something that we can go back and be like, oh, we should do this for this yeah. <laughs> Little tweaks. Jason Miller has another question, but this time it's a real one, Lizzie. Okay. It says, have you found that you have an idea for a game that you are in love with and then you just can't work on it because moving it from skull space to paper space makes it less good? Yeah. Tell us about that. That's a great answer. Yes. <laughs> Tell us the story. Well, there's uh, like the World War II game that I was working on. I really mm. have this cool idea and it's, it's I want to focus on um, the women in America as the men leave and they take over. Oh, that's awesome. Like running the town. And so mm -hmm. it's like a different side of that because, you know, all the World War II are like war games. So I really wanted to focus on the women on the home front and how they took over the challenges of running everything without the men. Right. Um, that would be a good name for it. Home front. Yeah. And the, the idea I had for the game and what I was putting out on paper were very different. Like it turned into like a cooperative and there was just a lot of stuff I didn't like. And I was like, I don't want a cooperative. I don't like, it was kind of going in, um, uh, what's the word? Supernatural. Hmm. Hmm. Like, kind of like where they're like kind of protecting the town from like some outside force. And I was like, you know what? No, this isn't what I want. I want it to be like more historical. I want it to be them, like the Rosie the Riveter type yeah, yeah, yeah. thing or like the taxi driver. I want to mm -hmm. focus more on like the actual things that happened while the men were gone and what they were doing and taking over. So like, it's trying to see if, I don't know if each person ha should have a different job that they're trying to do mm -hmm. or if they shall be working on like the same thing if it should take place in the factory. So that's really the game that is like this puzzle in my mind that I'm trying to figure out how to get it into a working space. Right. Then that's are you the fun challenge. Yeah, are you rebelling <laughs> against cooperatives though because you don't want it to seem like, you know, women cooperate all the time or No, just cuz I don't prefer cooperative games, so I want it to be a game that I absolutely love. So and you're saying you want it to be a game that you can beat Derek at. That's what you're saying. Not beat Derek. She wants to win. At. I just want to win. I, it's less satisfying for me in a cooperative game. Sure. I get that. I want to beat someone. That's just, and I know there's lots of people that love cooperative games and there's tons of great cooperative games out there, but it's just not my play style. And I don't want to design a game that's, that's not my play style. Fair enough. Fair enough. Mm -hmm. Jesse, what's on your mind, sir? Um, I got. I think mean, there's a few things on my mind. Erica has dropped a lot of really interesting questions over here, and um, so let's just jump onto lots of different topics and have no continuity. Um, yeah. Oh well. <laughs> you learn. You learn a lot of games. You um, do. Which means you have a lot of experience with good, bad, and ugly rule books. Oh, awesome question. Uh, what is a tip that you wish all rule book writers 
new. It was like one thing that every rule book could do better. Or your checklist if you have all of them. <laughs> there's, there's a fine line between being concise and being easy to understand. So yes. just because using you can say it in a really small amount of words and it's really easy for you to understand. You're the person who either designed it or you're the person who has a really deep understanding of the game. So you're like, oh yeah, I can just condense it down to this and people will be able to understand it. And then someone who's coming in who has no experience with the game, who has no idea what the mechanics are or anything, is trying to read something and they're like, this isn't making sense. And maybe later on as they're playing the game, they see what you mean. But being concise doesn't always get your point across. So sometimes mm -hmm. it might be better to explain things out a little better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what did we, we used to have a saying about concision. What was it, Jess? He's like, was that my saying? I don't know. I thought it was. <laughs> That's what that I, I, value, I value concision a lot to the point where I think I get like what Lizzie is saying. I might cut out too many words. So it's like mm. concision yeah. is the enemy of precision. I don't think that's what it was, but that sounds like it rhymes. I don't think that's right, though. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, yeah, I, no, I totally agree. Yeah. Audience is a big part of that, too, right? It's like yeah. what type of words you're using should resonate then with that audience. And concise, this yeah. might only work with like heavy gamers that get all the shorthand of things. Or that, or that like, have that have like the already in their mental space that what um, what I've heard some people call hooks. Yeah, right. You can say like put a worker in a spot and like there's there's a whole bunch of words in there that have much bigger meanings in, right in, that had, you know right in it. we had mm -hmm. someone in the group today asking about tableau and they're like is this a new thing have people been doing this for years and like they didn't quite understand what tableau because if you're in the board game industry and you've been playing lots of games you understand what that is we use that in the walking dead Land of fear but for other people they're like uh, this group of cards in front of me this is that what <laughs> yeah. you're talking about like, yeah, tableau yeah. Uh, right or or you were in drama because you created tableaus. Oh yes, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or is that maybe more of a Canadian thing because of the word? I'm not sure, but <laughs> no, that I, was I the idea of free framing. A, I think that's a French thing, to be honest. <laughs> okay. uh, Seb says hi. By the way, hi Sebby. Hi Seb. I spent all day with you. You're fine. Yeah, he's totally fine. <laughs> Go play uh, with daddy. Mommy's busy. Yeah, right. Fine. <laughs> oh, <laughs> just as a note, uh, I posted up on the Shop Talk page. If you want to go move to sunny California and live a couple hours, unfortunately, away from the Funkhausers, you too could be a senior game designer, game designer, or associate game designer at Renegade Games. They're hiring uh, in-house design. And um, I told Scott that while I liked uh, San Diego, um, my eldest son does not like tacos. So there's no way we can move to that San is, Diego. That is literally the only thing I already miss. <laughs> the tacos about living in California is the yes. tacos. Seb for uh, asks for tacos at least once a day. He'll ask for tacos for breakfast. So. I would ask for tacos for breakfast yeah. if my tacos were like that. He gets it. But yeah, if you're out, if you're out, if you're looking for a job in design land, and you know how hard it is to get those full time jobs, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Gata and Co are looking for three positions: senior, associate, and game wow. designer. I don't know what each of those entails, but. Go to the web page and look it up, okay? And it's right there for you. Uh, Erica has a bunch of, wow, you wrote a ton of questions. I just noticed. Um, let's I see. More. <laughs> Wait, what's the next one? What are we going to say next? Um, have oh, you, I like, um, yeah, go. Sorry, go. Have, you, um, have you ever received design advice that you wished you didn't follow? Oh. Don't. No, I'm gonna say no because I can't think of anything, and I'll probably think of something later tonight. And I was like, "Oh yeah." Um, I'm sad that we switched the IP for Walking Dead. That wasn't our choice, but I got very attached to the original one. So oh. that I was like, nice. I kept hey, telling Dirt, he's like, "Can you let us know what the original one was?" I guess, uh, it was Manifest Destiny. Oh, okay, cool. Oh, interesting. Like one of their so it's like if Lewis and Clark went west. Yeah. yeah encountered a bunch of like supernatural things instead of <laughs> you know just trying to find water uh, while right. we went to um so i really liked what we had done with that and the the art i mean we had just pulled from the comics but we i really liked that is, is there the the cho the chance of that coming out uh, as a game for you guys to do something with that that's not the same game but i mean it's skybound's ip so i could definitely 
go back and try and design something for it right. and offer it up to them. So, I mean, maybe in the future we'll have something for that IP, but... Like a sacrifice. It's <laughs> offer it up as a sacrifice. Sure, please. I like this story. <laughs> I want something from it. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> so, <laughs> from, from Skybound, does that kind of mean like their catalog is somewhat open to you that you could actually say, I like that. Could I pitch you a game based on that? Is that kind of what they're open to? I mean, yeah. Like, if I want to do anything with their anything from IP, from their IPs, but they also get approached a lot by other people mm. that are like, hey, why don't you make a game for this? So that's a lot of why I can't talk about things because it's not always Skybound stuff that we're working on. For and, sure. Like, other projects as well that we're bringing in. So I think there'll be a lot of really cool announcements, not just from me and Eric, but like the whole Skybound team as a whole. They're working on a lot of really cool ideas from Me other people and from Skybound. So. Yeah. Cool. Erica, ask some questions that you posted in the other chat line. Uh, okay. So here's a fun one because the roller coaster of getting into publishing a game is always a fun one that has lots of hindsight. <laughs> so I will say, what do you wish someone had told you before you kind of jumped into designing games? How much time and effort you're going to devote to it before you see anything? Because, I mean, we designed the Walking Dead game in like, we had a pretty solid prototype in a month that we were ready and then I mean taking art took a long time and then waiting till I got out I mean it's a grind it's not something that's gonna happen quickly so if you're mm -hmm. you want short-term satisfaction of like having it quick turnaround it's definitely not it's gonna take ages longer than you ever assumed it would take really <laughs> and I mean seriously the fate of the west there started working on that like four years ago. I remember like the night he came home and was like, I'm going to design a board game. And he got out his Catan pieces and was like doing all this stuff. And we started playing that. And we played it a ton when we were at Port Irwin. And then, I mean, we're still working on it the whole time, but it's been four years of the same game. I would also say don't get sick. You, you have to be able to not get sick of playing your same game over and that's over. That's a really good one. Is, don't get sick of your own game. <laughs> that is one that's totally <laughs> applicable to Erica right or, now too. Or don't design games so you'll get sick of. Yeah. No, well, the hard part is depending on how involved you are. But yes, you must yeah, love no. what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. If you're like after the second like playing and be like, oh man, I want to do something else, like probably not for you. Yeah. You're gonna be playing it over. I can't tell you how many times I've played Walking Dead. Probably like 150 at least. Honestly, mm -hmm. at PAX South this like in January, that's mm -hmm. literally what I did for three days was play The Walking Dead. Right. Yeah. So, so where do your design ideas tend to come from? I mean, we often talk about the, or sorry, not we, designers tend to talk about this in terms of mechanics or theme first. We, we also talk about experience first, but where for you, whether using those categories or somewhere else, do you typically find that sort of first spark that gets you started down the road? Um, well, it depends. Like with The Walking Dead, they came to us and were like, hey, you want to try and make a game for this IP? And so we're working backwards from, we have this theme, how can we compute that into a game? Um, but obviously my hopeful one day World War II game, I have this idea and I'm trying to get on paper. So it just depends on which strikes first. Cause sometimes we'll think of a really cool mechanic and we'll be like working on it and then be like, okay, how do we want to theme this? What do we want to work on it with? Um, and I think I tend to come a lot more from the, I have this theme idea like uh, when Derek was talking about like all the Mars games and I was like, let's just blow up Mars. And that was like a funny, like, Oh, that's a fun idea. And so I actually built out this little game about trying to get to like the center of Mars and blow it up. And you're like, drilling in and <laughs> yeah, but why terraform like, it when you can blow it up? Right. <laughs> well, I, I imagined it. Blow it up. Like, all the terraforming is over and it's like a desolate wasteland and it's like this useless orb out in space. So we're going to make room for something else. <laughs> We're gonna build so, a death so star basically you're you're talking about being you're like let's be vogons that's what you're saying exactly what i was thinking Maybe. you got let's an interstellar highway yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's awesome seconds too late yeah what are the questions you have there erica i, I don't know which one oh, they've asked. got mashed together okay cool so, sorry about that one. uh okay 
Let's see what the next. Okay, so here's a good one because, as you said, you have to play your game like 150 times. Let's talk a little bit about playtesting because we mm -hmm. haven't really gotten there. And so you're, I both like to hear kind of some of your advice that you give or some of the things that you you happen to like to do personally during playtesting, but also kind of how does playtesting work for you? Because obviously a lot of things are NDAs, and then how do you kind of arrange playtesting around that? Uh, when we were doing The Walking Dead. Um... Well, we did have the other version that we could bring out. We played it a lot. The two of us, Derek, took it to a game store that we played. And I think we just had, like, more blank type cards, which is, like, the ability is not so much the characters. And then we had people that we knew and we trusted that we would invite to our house and they would play it with us. Um, so we just kept the number of people that knew what it was to a minimum. Um, so in, when you get to other things, like, Mostly it's, we start out with our friends. It's not until we have a pretty solid working game that we're going to take it to like the proto spiel type stuff. Uh, we did that when we were in Chicago because I'm from Chicago originally. So we were living in Illinois. It was easy for us to go up there for that kind of stuff and take the games there. But. So that, is that what you tend to do? Most of your <laughs> playtesting ends up being more like prototyping mm -hmm. kind of events or do you find you have to arrange a lot more of your own now or do you kind of just use the people that you have to play games with? Uh, mostly it's people we play games with and we go back and forth when we're in Illinois. Um, Elk Creek Games was there and we would kind of swap back and forth. They'd bring us their stuff and we'd bring, us, bring them theirs. You know, um, so we do that and now that Derek was at Skybound, they're building like a playtester network Yes, I've noticed that. We utilize, so we'll be able to like send them the game and the rule books and be like, here, give us feedback. And so it'll be a lot easier to get those blind play tests in because that was something we struggled with was trying to find people to play blind because if, you know, we've been developing it and they've been helping us along the way, you know, it's kind of hard to be like, here, forget everything you knew about this game and give me some feedback that you haven't done before. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and is Derek responsible for that? The, like, um, the play test the play test yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's in charge of that at Skybound, so he's been setting that up and getting people signed up and working through what they're going to send out and when, so. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So um, at the end of the show, we're going to ask you a question, and you probably know what it is because you've seen the show before, but it's going to be about, you know, your advice to other people. So before you get there, though, I just did want to show this on screen. Let me just see if I can pull this up and see what happens. Come on. Why is my staging not moving over? There it is. Uh, I'm going to see if I can. Because Be Live doesn't up. like you anymore. I guess not, but um, I'm going to drop myself out of the picture here. And another picture will appear in his place. <laughs> what does that say? Careers? Yeah. Is that, the, is that hey. job posting? Yes. Renegade, Renegade Game, Studios. Game Studios. All right, so plug for a job, guys. You can go work at Renegade Game Studios as a senior it's game designer. Anymore. Oh, uh oh, that pushes Lizzie out. It pushed everybody out. Oh, okay. We're just voices now. We're just voices now. Sad, make it go away. <laughs> <laughs> Sad. <laughs> How does he make it go away? I do this. Okay. Uh -huh. I, I did, did that. Did you lose Lizzie? No, we didn't lose Lizzie. She's still here. Okay. But let me just see. I got to get rid of this. And now we all go back to this arrangement. Very weird. <laughs> we inverse. <laughs> yeah, we, we reversed all positions now. We, we played a little bit of uh, musical chairs. But I just kind of wanted to talk about that thing. But I guess I can't show it and talk at the same time. I'll have to figure that it's one out. There's over. a way. There is a way. I, re I, just I read it. it <laughs> I read it out loud, at least partly. Right. Oh! Oh no! Oh, Lizzie fell. Ah. I think you might have broke her sound again. <laughs> oh, maybe I don't know. Maybe I did something. Sorry, Lizzie. Oh, Lizzie. But let's see. Okay, so commensurate job title commensurate with experience. So I think they're looking for one of one of these roles: a senior or a game designer or associate. And so you get one of those roles um, oh, in creative development in San Diego. And here's Lizzie coming back. Okay, let's see. Sorry, guys. No, here we go. Yay! We go. Liz is okay. back. Now we're back. Okay. No, we're, and she's got voice. We're and we've organized again. Uh, we're, we're in different positions again. 
Anyways, it's a full-time job position at Renegade Game Studios in San Diego. But what I wanted to get at was the uh, all this, the summary of the, the game positions, essential duties and responsibilities. Uh, so the summary is that the game designer will create compelling gameplay that is true that is a true representation of the IP. They are expected to push the envelope of creativity and deliver an experience that is appropriate for the intended audience. Huh. That's, that's a neat way of describing the job position, right? Uh, essential duties... And responsibilities, designs and develops game play for Renegade products, responsible for ensuring that all products are an accurate extension of the IP and that they provide the customer with a unique and entertaining experience. Works with producer uh, like Dan Bojanski uh, to, to create the high quality, highest quality game experience possible. Uh, and Erica, you've worked with Dan a lot, have you? Yep. Yes. yes. Yeah. Over the <laughs> last... A uh, lot in the last yeah. like, year and a half. Yeah, for Scott... Pilgrim, which is on Kickstarter right now. Yeah. Scott Pilgrim is yeah. on Kickstarter. Uh, may work with internal and external designers and developers. May work with outside designers to develop their original designs. May travel to major events as promotional staff from time to time. Um, and then uh, supervisory responsibilities. Game designers will have the opportunity to lead both long and short-term teams. Education and experience. Uh, three plus years of experience with intellectual property development and game design. So there's a lot of stuff on here. Like there's more knowledge and skills here that we won't go through, but it's just interesting. Like I've never, ever seen a uh, game design job application uh, or a list of skills. So it's just neat to see it up there. I think we're going to see more of that. And we were like, I mean, I, are slowly, so. I, I think we're going to start seeing more and more <laughs> versions of, let's say a design studio that start to pop up in different ways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, Tim's here. Tim Devine. Uh, hey. No, you didn't kick the guest. You that was me making that a was mistake. Ted's fault. <laughs> yeah, you know it happens. Cool. So, Lizzie, I hope you've had some time to think about the piece of advice that you'd want to give to designers out there uh, who are, you know, hoping to crack into the business or who are just like maybe hitting a design block or something. What is it that you would like them to know? Um, well, first of all, just keep trying. There's so many roadblocks that you're going to hit that the first one may seem insurmountable, but trust me, there's more. So don't get discouraged <laughs> too easily. Wait a minute. But it gets harder. Just keep it, going because you're going to keep knocking not down. Not it's harder, but you're going to run into multiple things. It's never just one problem that's going to come up. I get it. I get it. I don't mean to be discouraging, but a lot of people might have an idea of, oh, I have this really cool idea. I'm going to play it five times with some family and friends and then take it to Kickstarter. And it, it does mm. take a lot more time. It takes a lot more effort than a lot of people assume. Um, so I think just being mentally prepared for a marathon, not a sprint. That's, that's fair. It is, it is a advice. lot more time than you often think it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And again, depending on how deeply involved you are. So I think currently... At least three of four of us I know are like deep, deep, deep in into. Uh, I guess Erica, you're sort of you sort of sort of got out of it, or are you still deep in what? Scott Pilgrim. Oh, well, I'm it, deep in Steven Universe right now. <laughs> oh, okay, so you're deep in something. And Lizzie, are you deep in anything right now, like development wise or content wise? Um, I mean, Fate of the West is probably the deepest I'm in right now. Uh, most of the other stuff is early works right now. Yeah. Right. But it's true that, you know, the, the, the more games you have and the more you're working on development and design, the more there's going to be, um, you know, hiccups. hiccups and these long roads to travel that it's not as easy as it seems like a lot of times when people see Kickstarters, it looks easy, but the amount of work that goes into a, an actual really successful one is mm -hmm. ridiculous, right? And then... There are some that just kind of happen to do okay or well with very little, but those are like a rarity nowadays. It's it's like that, you know, certain companies have sort of upped the game in, in terms of the format. So it's really and quite interesting. Just so much more competition that people expect a really polished game off the bat. They're not going to back a game that's only half-baked anymore because right. they just have too many other options. Yeah. Like, why am I going to spend 50 bucks on, or 49, sorry, <laughs> or 40, 39. Why am I going to spend 39 on 
in AA or like 79 on it's game be some... D. Yeah, that yeah. is that is much more developed, or they're, they're showing me much more up front, right? So a lot yeah. of it is definitely perception. Uh, and I think there's a big change over the last, you know, whatever, eight, nine years of Kickstartering that um, the perception has changed from rough and raw to polished and sellable. Uh, so whether or not Kickstarter believes it's a store or not, <laughs> I'm pretty sure the public thinks a little bit differently about it. the store, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and as starter. we said, like looping back to our earlier conversation of there's yeah. new people in the market, right? Think of how many more voices there are now saying, I want this, I want this. And I mean, you know, you kind of, who are you supposed to cater to? There's so Your much audience. divide now, you know, but that's the interesting thing is, is the audience, I think audiences have started to shift as well. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> and, and we see that it's, it's almost cyclical, right? That the, um, and Lizzie, you obviously see this on board game spotlight that you'll see these cycles of shelfies where it's all the same games. And anybody who started in the same year has all the same games as well as all the classics, right? It's pandemic, ticket to ride, and then whatever is hot that year. And then three years later, those people are selling off a whole bunch of their games to make room in their shelf for the new hotness. And and it's just interesting kind of cycle of buying that we see. And now Kickstarter has just kind of changed all that in some ways. I don't know if it's for the better, to be honest. I'm not, I'm not really sure. What are your thoughts on Kickstarter, Lizzie? It's completely unpredictable. Like, it is. we've been dealing with it for so long, and you finally think you have it figured out, and then it throws you some kind of crazy curveball, and you're like, oh, okay, this is new. Because it used to be minis. If your game had minis, it was fine. And then it was, you know, there was that issue with Colossal and multiple games on the same yeah. time. And then it's like, okay, well, is this like a firm thing now that they're going to be doing? And then now with the whole strike, I mean, I feel like every time you're like, okay, everything's smooth sailing and we've kind of gotten Kickstarter figured like, out, nope. they just throw us another curveball and there's there's no way to predict anything anymore. Right. I mean, this month has been very crazy and we've had a lot of games not fund in the first like 24, 48 hours that did squeak out and like ended up funding in like the last week. And I think that's really uncommon because it used to be if you didn't fund right away, they would like scrap it and come back or they just were like, oh, OK, this isn't the game right now. But there's been a lot more funding throughout the campaign that we've been seeing. I wonder if that's a, a better thing anyway, because mm-hmm. the whole like about maybe funding immediately a year to six months ago, like in that time period, it was that exactly what you're saying, where it's like start it doesn't fund, scrap it, start a game. And I don't know if that's a great mentality to have. That seems very weird to me, but people Sorry. seem to be okay with it. Seb came home. He's going to bed. So. Oh, yeah. good night, Seb. Good night. Night. <laughs> He's so awesome. Cool. Well, how about we let you go say good night? Oh, there we go. We can all night. say good night. Good night, we'll say Seb. Good night all together. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. night, night. Sorry. Yeah, that kid's gonna like grow up on on Facebook, really. <laughs> he he's got his own audience. Kind of does. He's his, he's his own little. We did, yep. did have requests for Seb when we announced you. So see, now we've fulfilled Here. that. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> also, yeah, one second. We've we need to change the text on the screen then. and Seb. It's <laughs> because I, I said bye bye. <laughs> Because <laughs> we can let her go. Yeah. So we go to bed. Well, and well, well, there we go. All, All right. right, cool. So, Lizzie, where will we see you next? I will be at PAX Unplugged next. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah. And there will be a BGG, but I'm not going to that one. Okay, and where can people find you online on a regular basis, as if I need to ask? Uh-huh. I am all over Facebook, so Board Game Spotlight, you can always find me there. We do have a business page if you want to message me. Um, and then we have the Board Game Spotlight Instagram, BG Spotlight. And then um, my, my email is lizzie at theboardgamespotlight.com. Cool. And, and you can uh, find it on any of my sites. When, when you get a chance, Jesse, you should talk to Lizzie about Instagram, because Jesse wants to start mm-hmm. up Meeple Syrup Instagram, and Eric and I are like, we know nothing about Instagram. Erica I was just found out I had one in June. Exactly, that she had an Instagram account. You have now one I have like know. two. She started it up like years ago, I have like 250 ago, people now. Look at me go. <laughs> you go, girl. Yeah, well, That's awesome. Yeah, someone told me today that TikTok is where, it at, where it's at, and I need to get a TikTok, and I'm like, 
it's I'll TikTok. be honest, I have no idea what that is. Yeah. Is that like the it's new like platform? It's like the new Snapchat, apparently, or the new Instagram. I don't know. Someone I think it's the new Snap. Like, or it, it might be the new Vine, actually. It's kind of Because like I always see Instagram. little videos, like little loop videos from there. It's, it's a bunch of stuff. So I might have to make one eventually. I don't know. I'm not prepared <laughs> to do that yet. Instagram is going really well, and I finally have it kind of like where I want it. So I don't think I want to start another thing. Yep. Got to keep up. Got to keep up. Cool. Uh, Jesse, where can we find you, sir? You can find me in the Maple Syrup Shop Talk um, and on Facebook. You can also find me on Twitter at TT Void. And how about you, Erica? Uh, usually game stuff for me is on Twitter. It's Frenemy Games, Frenemy with an I for the friend part. Uh, but I'm usually on Facebook as well and apparently also on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> and you can find me at Senfong Lim on Twitter, Maple Syrup Shop Talk on Facebook. Um, and with that, I would just like to say thank you once again to Roll to Play Network, our podcast host and the network we're proud to be a part of. If you have any you know, love for us at all, you know, check out our Patreon page. Jesse just asked a question for our Patreon supporters about what he's going to do um, for part of his little part of the whole thing. Uh, he wants to know, should he do a book club? Should he do like little 10 minute uh, solo segments? Um, that kind of stuff. Uh, workshopping thing. So Jesse wants to know. So if you're part of the Patreon, you can go there. So www.patreon.com slash meeple syrup. And our supporters will also this month help Jesse buy a new microphone. So Ooh, that's where the funding man. is going for this month. That's an because upgrade. if you've ever heard wild typing, it's always like Jesse. Always Jesse. We're working on it, guys. So we're working on that. <laughs> cool. So thank you very much. And we'll be back next week. And what's happening next week? Uh, next week we have Joyce Lynn, I think. Oh, right, right, right. Yes. And we're going to take um, a look at their game yeah uh queering space time it's, nice uh, yep. yeah excellent 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 so until then we'll see you later uh check us out on the meeple syrup shot talk and if you want to chat and also board game spotlight to see uh what lizzie's up to and see her beat derek umpteen times we'll be on in like 20 minutes so. yeah awesome there you go. all right, all right. So see you all later good night see you all later. thanks for having me thank Bye. you for coming Thanks so much for listening to the Meeple Syrup Show. If you'd like to support us on all of our projects, please check out our Patreon page at www.patreon.com backslash Meeple Syrup. Hope to see you next week.